All right, I got a request to make a video solution from the, the harder one here, the harder book. Uh, it has to do with our basic optics, chapter 25, before we you know get to the other chapters where we kind of apply our basic optics. This is kind of a, a Snell's Law problem. Uh, I guess it also fits with dispersion, but uh, let me just read it here. It says, a narrow beam of light contains both red and blue. Okay, so maybe I'll take my red pen and my blue pen. All right, so it contains both red and blue wavelengths that travel from the air through a one centimeter thick piece of crown glass and then back into the air again. Okay, so let's see. Uh, maybe I'll use black to kind of draw the piece of crown glass. So here's the crowned glass. And what it says, and maybe I'll draw the, the red first. And if, if I go on to read it here, it says, if the beam strikes at an incident angle of 30 degrees. Okay, so here comes this red beam of 30. Now, for that matter, it made it very clear that there was a red and a blue. All right, so we've got both colors. They come in, they each strike at 30 degrees. And it then says, A, at what angle do the colors uh, emerge? So let, let's just talk about one color at a time here. Uh, I'll do the red. And so the red is going to refract and bend towards the normal. For that matter, the blue will too, but let me just kind of draw the red one. Then when the red one exits, it's going to bend or refract again, this time away from the normal. And that is the question, what is this angle right there when it exits? Uh, now, fortunately, it really does not depend on what color we have. In other words, what the index is. Now, let me pause for a moment because as I said, this problem really is involving not only refraction, but also dispersion. So if I pull the book out and I kind of look here at crown glass, it says for red, the index is 1.512. So well, let me write that down. The N... The index of refraction for red is 1.512. But for blue, and they give a wavelength of 700, I mean 470. So crown glass scanning along here for blue is 1.524. So 1.5, uh-oh, did I say 2.4? Yeah, 2.4, okay. So, you'll see, as we talked about, this is what we mean by dispersion, that the bending of the light or the slowing down of the light as it enters the crown glass or the speeding up when it exits is slightly different. And so that's why, if you kind of had a detailed picture of this, the blue having a higher index has a higher speed change and therefore it's going to bend more. So it bends closer to the normal and of course it bends back away from the normal and actually ends up going in the same direction as the red, maybe shifted over a little bit and so these two that were on top of each other have now been separated. And so this would be a good way of separating the rainbow, making a separation of the uh, the colors. And that's what we explained was the cause of a, of a rainbow here. Now, the first part of this might be the, the easier part because let me not even distinguish whether I have red or blue, although I'll kind of think in my head that I have the red one. But see, if I were to apply Snell's Law right here, I would say we're starting in the air, so maybe I'd put index of the air times the sine of this 30 degrees. 
that would have to equal the N of the glass. And like I said, I won't even distinguish whether I'm talking about red or blue, at least not yet. I'll just say N of the glass. And if I'm talking about red, I'll use that number. If I'm talking about blue, I'll use this number. Okay. But then I would have sine of, and we've been writing these as theta 1 and theta 2. So let me call it theta 2. But you need to understand that this theta 2 would be this angle here. Now, it's probably worth drawing a little bigger picture. Because as the light comes in, this is the 30 degrees. And then it bends towards the normal. It's this angle that I'm referring to as theta 2. But watch what happens. If this is a piece of flat glass, then these two normals are parallel to each other. And so this is a transient across two parallels. And what we say then is alternate interior angles are equal. So in other words, the angle of incidence as it comes out of the glass is the same as the refracted angle as it was entering the glass. That's going to be a key step. Because if I apply Snell's Law right here, and of course now say it bends away from the normal, this is the theta we're looking for. This is that theta that they're asking for. And so when you apply Snell's Law here, this is the incident angle. So you would say N of the glass times the sine of this incident angle 2, which is equal to number 2, would then equal to N of the air times the sine of what we're looking for. So we have applied Snell's law here as it enters the glass and applied Snell's law as it exits the glass. And you can kind of see then that applying Snell's law as it enters, we have these two factors that are the same two factors as it exits the glass. In other words, these factors, which are the refracted angle, and this factor, which is the incident angle for the second time, are actually equal. So what I can do is take this original, which is the index of the air times the sine of 30 degrees, must then equal this, which is the index of the air times the sine of the angle I'm looking for. And that would just cancel off, and then obviously sine of 30 degrees must be the sine of some angle, must be 30 degrees. Uh, and so what ends up happening is the same amount it bends towards the normal because of the speed change equals the same amount it bends away from the normal, again, because of the, the speed change. And so not a surprise, it's kind of heading in the same direction. Although, and this is going to come into play, it's not the same as if it just went in a straight line. If it just went in a straight line, sure, it'd be going in that same direction, but because it did actually bend a little bit, there's a shift in it. And so where the beam actually goes may be parallel to where it would have gone if it hadn't hit this glass piece here. But it is shifted a little bit. And so there's, you know, somebody over here, you know, might trace it back and think the light's coming from over here somewhere. But in reality, it's coming from over here which is, of course, what you would totally see if there wasn't a piece of glass it would go here. And so the, the appearance of where it is is shifted over. So if you ever look at something through a window here, uh, the light's actually shifted sideways. You know, if you're standing in your room looking out the window and you say, well, there's a car. Okay, that car, it's been shifted over a little bit. Now, a car is such a big object, and we're probably talking a shift of, you know, maybe a millimeter or two. Uh, that's not going to matter here. But if the glass was really thick, that could be noticeable or problematic. Or, like I said, if the object's really small, a shift of a millimeter could, could, could make a difference for some object that was smaller than a millimeter. So it depends on how much detail you're, you're, you're kind of after here, you know, and the size of the things you're, you're looking at. But what I wanted to say in this first part, then, 
It says, what angles do the two beams emerge at? They're both going to be 30 degrees. Uh, uh, watch this. If I were to draw the blue one, it would start right on top of it, and it would bend a little bit more towards the normal. And, of course, then when it exits, it would bend away from the normal a little bit more than the red, getting back to the same direction. That's why I wanted to do this math by not actually saying, what is the index? Uh, because they're slightly different, but notice it wouldn't matter if they are slightly different. They bend back, and of course, you have this beam, and so there is now kind of a separation between the red light and the blue light. So they may both have started in the same path, and so not only go in the same direction, but they're overlapping, but by hitting them, they now come out parallel to each other and separated in space. And so this is a way of kind of separating the different colors, especially if we had a whole white light beam. And the green light would have an index, <coughs> excuse me, somewhere in between the red and the blue. And so the green would be here. So if you put a you know piece of paper here, you would see kind of a ra rainbow effect. You would see a little bit of green light here, a little bit of red light here, and a little bit of blue light here. Whereas if you put a paper on the original beam, it just looks white because they're all on top of each other. And so there there is you know some some significance about this. And and so like I said, there is this this shift. And I think that's the the harder piece of this. Because it says, then, <clears throat> by what distance are the red and the blue separated when they emerge? So, how far apart are these? Okay, well, maybe I should just go back to thinking about one beam here at a time. Okay, so here's the red one. Uh, the red one would look something like this. Here comes the red beam. And again, 30 degrees. It bends towards the normal. Okay. And then as we just proved mathematically, it would bend away from the normal. Exactly the same amount it bent towards the normal, so it would be headed off into the same direction. That is, this dotted line is where the light would have gone had it not entered into this glass piece. And so I'm going to draw a right angle here to say this distance right here, let me call it D, is actually the amount of distance the red one shifted. And, and so let, let, let's see if I can kind of figure out what that would be. And in fact, I would say that this D, and if you kind of look at this angle right there, uh, let me call that angle alpha for a second. I have a right triangle in here. Okay. Um, no, no, let me... Man, yeah, well... Okay, yeah, all right. I'm gonna look at another right triangle also. I don't know if this is the most efficient way of getting here, but uh, this angle is the refracted angle. So this is what we keep referring to as theta two, okay? But you can see that this distance is the hypotenuse of both of these, okay? And this right here, I'll call it T, is the thickness of the glass. So cosine of theta 2 is the thickness here over this hypotenuse. Let me call it H. And then this other triangle, and I should say right triangle, which has the angle alpha in it, the sine of alpha is the opposite, so that's the D over its hypotenuse. 
hypotenuse. And again, they share a hypotenuse. And so maybe I will take this first equation and solve it for the hypotenuse and put it into this one. So sine of alpha equals to D over this hypotenuse, which is T over cosine theta 2. Or maybe I'll write it as D over T times cosine of theta 2. Now, remember, we're after this D. We're after how far did it, did it shift. And so let me move the thickness over. And let me go sine of alpha. Let me divide it by cosine of theta 2. And then that would be the D. Okay. So I'm, I, I, hopefully I'm getting somewhere with a little bit of trigonometry here, is how far over is this beam? And it's a distance of, of D. Now, theta 2, I'm going to get from Snell's Law. So let me hold off on that. But hopefully then you can also see that the sum of these two together is this angle that it came into. In other words, the theta 2 plus the alpha is the 30 degrees. So alpha is 30 degrees minus theta 2. And see, that's perfect, because if I can just figure out what theta 2 is, the refracted angle, and that's I'm going to use the uh, law of refraction, I can get then not only theta 2 from the law of refraction, I can get alpha. I can punch it into here, get the thickness of the glass, which is given, and see how far it shifted over. So that's what I'm going to do. Let, let me do Snell's law, the law of refraction. So I can find this theta 2. So I'm going to start in air, which is 1.0003. And the inputted angle, they said, is 30 degrees. So that's the red beam here coming in. And uh, let me use the number for, for red. And as we wrote down earlier on, the index for red is 1.512. And then sine of theta 2. So I've got a little bit of calculator work here to figure out what theta 2 is, but that will then lead to my answer. So I'm going to take the 1.0003 and multiply it by the sine of 30, okay? Uh, then I'm going to divide it by 1.512. Then I'm going to take the inverse sine of all of that. And so this must be about a 19.32 degrees. All right. And that's that magical step, because now, if I come back over here, I can then say D equals, and so I'll start with the thickness. Let me come back to the question. You know, they said it was one centimeter thick, okay. And so then I will have the sine of this alpha, which we said would be the 30 degrees minus theta 2. And then I will divide it by cosine of theta 2. All right, so I will go 30 and subtract the last answer. So that's about a 10 degrees. So the sine of that last answer, so that's the numerator, I will then divide that by cosine of the 19.32 degrees, and I multiply it by 1, and so we're looking at 0 0.19, and I'm going to do some extra decimals here, uh, 1964 centimeters. So it's not much of a shift, like I said, just, just shy of two millimeters. But that red light is shifted over by 
almost two millimeters. And of course, if you had a different color, and as we drew the picture earlier, where'd it go here? Uh -huh. Blue having a higher index is going to bend more, and so it's going to be shifted a little bit more. But the logic of our math would still be the same. We would just have to find out what theta 2 is based upon an index for blue. So let, let, let's do this calculation again. I'll even use my blue pen for that. So, so this is saying 1.0003 for the index of air times a sine of 30 degrees. And then here's the slightly different index. Uh, let's see, you wrote it down here, 1.524, 1.524, and then sine of theta two. So again, not much. That's why I wanted to carry maybe some extra decimal places here because there's not gonna be too much difference between this red and the blue. But I'll do the 1.0003, times the sine of 30 degrees again. And now I'll divide it by a little bigger index. So when I take the inverse sine of all of this, we're looking at a smaller number. Uh, means it shifted more, because remember it's coming in at 30 degrees. So if it didn't shift at all, it'd still be 30. Now they're all gonna, then get lower numbers because they shift towards the normal and the angles measured from the normal. But the, So that means the smaller the number, the more it shifted. So be careful. This is a smaller number than the red one. That means it shifted more, okay? Because we're going to 30 and then we're going down. So this one shifted more. Because it shifted more, you can see then when it comes out, shifting back to being parallel, it's gonna be further over. And so let's use this mathematics to figure that out. So D would equal to the thickness, T, uh, where'd it go here, thickness, times the sine of, and so this would be the 30 degrees minus the 19.16 over the cosine of the 19.16. All right. So I'm going to take the 30 and subtract the last answer. So that's this number, a little difference. Take the sine of that last answer. And then I'm going to divide that by the cosine of the 19.16. And technically multiply it by 1. So that means it shifted over 0 0.1991 centimeters. And that, of course, is a hair bigger than that one. And so I believe the question wasn't asking how much they shifted over, but ultimately how much they separated. Where's that question? By what distance are the red and the blue then separated? So if I subtract the two, Um, the 19th cancel off. So I basically have a 90. I'll just go 90 minus 70. That's a 20. Uh, but it's actually a 26, 27. So this would be a 27. 91 from 64. It's 20. Is that right? 26, 27. Yeah. Okay. And then two zeros. And we've been doing units of centimeters. So they're really tight together. This is, you know, this, this is not a, a, a very detailed way of separating them, but it can work and uh, it does separate them. And we've got, of course, Snell's Law. That's the fundamental idea. Physics is about knowing how to apply a few fundamental principles. So we just got a Snell's Law. We can figure out how a lens works. We can figure out how a microscope works. Oh, and we can do all these crazy things with Snell's Law because it's Snell's Law that controls the light. And so in this case, we control the light. In this case, separating the colors and, you know, yeah. And so if we wanted to separate out the colors or rejoin them, if we already had a rainbow and we wanted to then reconverge them. And so we're trying to make some kind of color, we could generate the separate colors and then convert them together. That would be another way. And then we can send this out as one kind of overlap of all the colors. That's pretty common, blending the colors together. We could have like a digital display and we got to make the individual tones and then merge them together and put them out on the display of our screen. 
And so there's a lot of engineering that goes uh, behind that, a lot of optical engineering. All right, well, like I said, hard one, good one. Hope that helped. Bye.